Well, good morning and welcome to the service of the word for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Uh, I do apologize that we had to cancel worship, but uh, we felt it was in the best interest of everybody that uh, we keep you all safe and off the roads. So, so I hope uh, many of you were able to join us over the digital medium. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, since we were supposed to have noisy offering today, we'll just carry that over to next Sunday and you can bring your loose change next week. A um, couple of prayer requests. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So if you, if you saw the prayer list, uh, you may have noticed a couple of names on it. Um, there's uh, the name Dan McGee and Danny Riles. Dan McGee was a jet engine mechanic that worked for me in Germany and was in a near-fatal car accident. Um, we didn't think he was going to make it, but thanks be to God, he did. And this was back in, was it 2009, honey? I think it was 2009. He had something like 18 surgeries in the first year. It was really devastating to his body, but he recovered. And um, he's been doing pretty well, but uh, this last couple of weeks, he's been having problems with some of his in internal organs. And... Uh, they had to go back in and do some surgery, so I would just ask that you hold Dan in your prayers. And uh, the other one is my friend Danny Riles, who worked with me in my last assignment in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And Danny has been, um, he's a little bit older, he's, he, uh, he retired from active duty service probably 20 years ago, um, <clears throat> and he, uh, he's been suffering from complications due to COVID, um, and eventually was put on a ventilator early in the week. Um, and unfortunately, Danny passed away on Friday. So I would ask you to please keep his family, especially his wife, Kathy, in your prayers. Um, and we do have some other folks uh, in our own church family that uh, could use your prayers right now. Um, so please, uh, please just remember our whole church family and everybody that's struggling with the virus and with the lockdown and uh, everything associated with our current Situation across our country and our state. <clears throat> um, so, I think we're going to uh, press on with uh, with our worship this morning. I want to thank uh, Veda Hoyle for being my worship assistant today and braving the weather. Thank you. Uh, so, we will be using again service of the word. If you have a, a Lutheran book of worship at home, the Green Book, it starts on page one hundred twenty-six. So, uh, but before we start, I'd just ask that everybody just take a quiet moment, center yourself, and prepare to come into God's presence. We begin with the dialogue on page 126. Holy is the Lord, the Almighty. He was, he is, and he is to come. He is worthy of glory and honor and power. He created all things. By his will they came to be. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain. Worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. By his blood he purchased for God people of every race and tongue, of every folk and nation. Christ made of them a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they shall reign on earth forever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> At this point, I would like us to read together um, the words to Canticle, which are the first few uh, hymns in the hymn book. Canticle number 15. <clears throat> Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord and he will have compassion and to our God who will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow fall from the heavens and return not again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I sent it. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you know the perilous choices we are prone to make that fall short of your desire for human faithfulness and obedience. Without you, our fragile nature cannot survive. Support us with your word of truth that we may grow in faith in the midst of our trials. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our service continues with the lessons. The first reading is from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Here ends the reading. We will now read responsively the psalm. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. He works of his hands are faithful. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. 
Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The second reading is Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may, there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, wait, former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, he will not be encouraged. If his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to his idols, and so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak. You sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Here ends the reading. Am I on now? There we go. It's the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Jesus, Simon, Andrew, James, and John went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere, throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we've been working our way through the season of Epiphany, we have seen a variety of ways in which Jesus Christ is revealed as the Son of God. How he reveals himself and how he is revealed in other ways. Today we see another way in which he's revealed, through the words of an unclean spirit, that is, a servant of the wicked foe, also known as Satan. In Mark's gospel account, the very first miracle that Jesus performs, the first sign of power that he uses to reveal himself is the casting out of an unclean spirit, a demon. 
For Mark, casting out demons was one of the most emphasized aspects of Jesus' ministry throughout his gospel. But let's not forget that in order for us to believe that Jesus had power and authority over unclean spirits, evil spirits, we must first admit that they exist. There are those today who tell us that there is no such thing. They tell us that the devil is like the boogeyman, a made-up story to scare people into doing what you tell them they should be doing. Follow God's law or the devil will get you. I've been rebuked by both pastors and laypersons for even talking about the devil in a previous sermon and by someone I know who sees the devil in exactly this way. This is how they describe the devil, made up. And they make him out to be nothing more than a manipulative idea. I can't help but be reminded of a line from one of my favorite movies, a movie called The Usual Suspects. In describing a truly evil character in this story, one who was so secretive and evasive that no one was actually sure he was real, a con man says this, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people that he didn't exist. I find it interesting that this movie quote from a 1995 film can also be attributed to different philosophers and theologians going back at least 150 years. This idea is not new. Remember, the devil is the prince of lies. And he is very, very good at what he does. He tricks us into misunderstanding God's word, just as he did the first humans. He tricks his victims into doing things they wouldn't do otherwise. He twists truth so that either we can't see the truth for what it is, or we end up believing some distorted version of the truth. And that is how we find ourselves wandering into dark places. Let me be clear here. Acknowledging the existence of the devil does not give him any power over your life. But by acknowledging that there is such a thing as evil, that the devil does work in the world around us, that he is constantly trying to interrupt the work of Christ and interfere in the relationship that God wants to have with each one of us by acknowledging that the devil is out there and that he is doing these things. We can at least partially diagnose the reality of our problems. You see, the root of our problems is sin with a capital S. Sin is anything that gets in the way of our relationship with God. Sin is being focused on self and not on God or on others. Being focused inward instead of outward. And how did sin enter into the world? That's the story of the fall of humanity. How the first humans were evicted from Eden where they had been living in harmony and peace with God. In communion with him and with each other. But the serpent tricked the woman into eating the forbidden fruit. How did he do this? He lied to her. He twisted God's own word and used it to tempt her to break God's one law. And she fell for it. Now, she'd never encountered a lie before, so I don't really blame her. She didn't know what dishonesty was. And we all know who the serpent was. That was Satan, the prince of lies. And this is exactly how he operates. The devil knows God's word better than any scholar. And he knows who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. That is why the unclean spirit in today's gospel acted like it did. It reacted in fear because it knew it was facing ultimate defeat. It knew that Jesus had complete authority and power to go with it. And it knew this evil spirit 
knew that it was in trouble. So why did this evil spirit start shouting out loud who Jesus is? As Mark's gospel tell, tells the story, it seems obvious that this is a desperate attempt to hurt Jesus' mission, or at least interfere in his plans. The first thing Jesus commands the spirit is to be silent. Jesus isn't ready to reveal himself yet. It's possible the spirit knows this and is trying to interfere somehow before being cast out and destroyed. But whatever the reason, this unclean spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. And in its fear of destruction, it shouted this out to everyone in the synagogue. Now whether Jesus was actually ready to reveal himself or not on that particular day, his demonstration of authority in casting out this evil spirit definitely showed anyone there that he was no ordinary teacher. Did you notice how the people at the synagogue reacted? And they were all amazed so that they questioned themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. They saw this as a new teaching with authority. Jesus cast that spirit out and he defeated the wicked foe permanently in his death and resurrection. And the devil knows this, but he and his minions are unwilling to accept defeat. Remember, the devil twists truth for his own purposes. He's lost. But if he can make people think that he hasn't, he can still have influence over them. Now, I don't know about you, but I look around at the chaos of the last 12 months, and I'm convinced that the devil's hand is in it. He's doing what he does best, twisting truth, finding ways to hide the truth or cloud it so much that we can't see it. Now, ask yourself this question. When you turn on the TV or read something on the internet, do you right away know for sure that it's true? Can you tell what's true and what isn't? How did we as a society get to a place that we don't know who to believe anymore? Who is responsible for that? It certainly seems to me like the work of the Prince of Lies. So we all need to remember exactly that. The devil is the prince of lies and he has already lost. Jesus has already defeated him. And just as he did in our gospel lesson today, Jesus casts out the devil just by commanding him. Do you remember the words of Martin Luther's famous hymn? Though hordes of devils fill the land, all threatening to devour us, we tremble not, unmoved we stand, they cannot overpower us. This world's prince may rage, in fierce war engage, he is doomed to fail, God's judgment must prevail, one little word subdues him. That's all it takes, one little word. And if you're curious about what that little word is, Luther says it's liar. When we call out the devil for who he really is, calling him a liar. One theologian I read offers us this instruction. Christians must not fear or ignore the devil. Both positions are dangerous. We know that Jesus has already defeated him, so we don't need to fear him. But to ignore him is also bad. It lowers our guard. Let me close with this story. A friend and associate of boxers, the American writer Wilson Meisner, was himself a talented fighter. One night, Meisner and the boxer mysterious Billy Smith visited a San Francisco bar. 
where Meisner started a fight with some longshoremen. At the end, only one longshoreman was left standing. Although Meisner rained punches at him, this longshoreman stayed obstinately upright. Suddenly, Billy Smith noticed what was happening. Leave him alone, Wilson, he shouted. I knocked him out five minutes ago. On investigation, it turned out that a punch from Smith had indeed knocked the longshoreman out cold, but it also wedged him vertically between two pieces of furniture. The author says this is an accurate picture of our already defeated but still standing enemy, Satan. So I want you to remember that image. The longshoreman knocked out cold, but his limp body stuck upright between two pieces of furniture. That's how impotent the devil really and truly is. He can taunt us. He can confuse us. He might even scare us. But he can't undo our salvation. That is already assured for us. He can't undo Christ's resurrection. That is already accomplished. And it is the proof of the devil's own defeat. And the devil can't prevent God's promises to us. Those are already guaranteed by the God who always keeps his promises. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'll now ask Veda to lead us in the prayers of the church. And as she's preparing for that, I forgot I have one more prayer request. Um, you may recall uh, several months ago, I mentioned um, my son John's elementary school teacher last year, Caitlin Reese, uh, was battling breast cancer at the uh, all too young age of 26. Anyway, she's in her mid-20s. She went through that treatment and and the treatment itself was very successful. On Friday, she had a seizure, was taken to the hospital where they discovered that she now has a brain tumor. Um, not sure exactly what's going to happen now, but she is going to be treated. And uh, I would ask that you keep her and her family in your prayers as she battles this, this cancer. Thank you. With gratitude for the gift of Christ, let us draw near to our Heavenly Father in prayer, asking His mercy for the church, the world, and all who need His loving kindness. Wise and good Father, help us to acknowledge you as the source of all wisdom and not to lean on our own understanding. We praise your holy name for giving us the freedom to come to you through prayer in all matters and at all times. Your word is faithful and trustworthy, so let us be guided by your steadfast ways in all we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Create in us a grateful heart to receive all that you provide and to praise you through meaningful worship together. Teach us to be more Christ-like in all that we do, that we may continue to build up your church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Lord, you are a wise and generous God. We pray for the wisdom of our elected leaders in our community, state, and country. We ask for your guidance and continued presence with them as they make decisions concerning your people. We also pray for the well-being of our leaders and that they would be of sound mind and body so they could do their important work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father God, you are the source of all comfort. We pray all for those who are mourning in pain or struggling with trials. 
Today we pray especially for everyone on our prayer, prayer list. Those we name now in our hearts. And those known only to you. May they gain strength in the knowledge of your promise of eternal life and know your abiding presence in the here and now. The Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, help us consistently care for the leaders and pastors of our church, particularly Bishop Dan and his staff, Dean Nathan, and all clergy in the Carolinas Mission Region. May we continue to lift them up in prayer for their own well-being and for the well-being of the whole church. We pray, we thank you for their presence in the church and in the world as beacons of light and hope to a people in need of your peace, presence, and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with our brothers and sisters at St. Stephen's, Christ United, St. James, and Mount Calvary Lutheran churches as they discern the call for a new pastor. Assure them of your Holy Spirit's presence in and through the call process and lead us to be good neighbors to them during their transition. Bless their interim pastors as they lead them through the season of change. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, merciful Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, at this time, I would like us to again read together the words to Canticle number 20. Canticle number 20. Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Bearing the human likeness revealed in human shape, he humbled himself in obedience, accepting death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has raised him to the heights, And bestowed on him the name above all names. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven, on earth, and in the depths. That every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. That concludes our service of the word today. Thank you very much for joining us. I pray that all of you are safe and warm and dry. Um, And barring any unforeseen circumstances, we will return to our normal schedule next Sunday. And next Sunday will be uh, the distribution of Holy Communion. So, until we can be together again, may God bless and keep you.